video we'll be looking at the factors that would affect evolution. So uh, in another video I've talked about the hardy weinberg principle which states that the allele frequency will stay the same as long as there are no, as long as it's in the population that is not changing and not evolving. But however in reality that evolution must be occurring no matter how slow it might be because it's impossible to expect that there's absolutely no mutation and complete random uh, mating uh, amongst uh, a large population or sometimes even a small population. So here are the four major factors that would affect evolution. So the first one is mutation, right? So mutation is talk about a random change to the DNA based sequence uh, of uh, in the genome of a particular organism or a cell. So uh, this mutation would lead to genetic variation, uh, and sometimes it could be uh, talk about how it changes from a dominant uh, changes between a dominant allele and a recessive allele. And we say the favorable allele would be selected, and uh, meaning giving a particular favorable condition or adaptation to the individual, uh, increase its chances to survive and reproduce. So mutation is one driving factor for evolution. The better one, the more the, the favorable allele would be selected to be passed on to the next generation. Another factor would be any changes to a population size. Now actually there are two major things that would cause a change in the population size. So we've got two types, we've got density dependent factors and density independent factors. So we say that density dependent factors are things that actually would be affected because of the size of the population. So for example, competition and predation. So these are two things that would um, would actively be affected by the original size. So for example, the larger the population, the more interest specific competition there would be. Or the larger the size of the of the predators, then it would have a direct impact on the population size of the prey. So that's what we mean by a density dependent factor. But for the density independent factor are things that would affect the population size regardless of its original size. So things like natural disasters and climate change. It doesn't actually matter how many uh, individuals you have to begin with because everyone's going to be affected. So, uh, it, and actually depending on how big of a change of the population size, it could lead to uh, slightly different things. So if there is a smaller change in the population size, then it could lead to gene flow. And what we simply mean by that is is talk about how uh, the alleles are going from one place to the other. So usually this is uh, gene flow. It would be because of uh, things like migration. So uh, birds migrate, seasonal migration going from one place to the other. So that is an example of gene flow. But sometimes if we have a larger change to a population size, then it will be uh, what we call a genetic bottleneck. Uh, which, and we say the difference between gene flow and genetic bottleneck is that genetic bottleneck would have a, an effect on future generations. It's almost like causing a, an irreversible change to the total number of alleles in that particular population. And usually this is because of things like uh, natural disaster. So this is quite a nice illustration here. So imagine in, to begin with, we've got um, many genetic variation and then larger population size. We've got, um, we've got people or individuals with gene A, B, C, D, and E. So like five different types of individuals. However, with a particular um, natural disaster that has drastically reduced the population size because lots of them died in that particular disaster, then at the end of it, we only got A people, uh, you know, individuals of A and B left because C, D, and E wasn't able to survive in that particular scenario, let's just say. So that's what we mean by a genetic bottleneck, is that there is a drastic change in that. And actually, looking at that population, you see that um, only uh, if they continue to develop, then the whole population, the new population, will only consist of people of gene A and gene B. So as you can see, a small change or a large change to the population size could have different degrees of impact on terms of the evolution uh, or the number of values in, in different uh, situations here. Another third thing that would affect evolution would be uh, something called genetic drift. And it's something that we often see in a smaller population. So the difference between genetic drift and the previous one when I talked about uh, genetic bottleneck is the fact that genetic bottleneck is the result of a massive change. Whereas a genetic drift is uh, happening in a population that is originally small to begin with. So we're saying that, for example, it could be different things. It could be, um, let's say, a random mutation or a random, a new uh, selection pressure that has caused a particular individual within the small population to experience a massive impact of it. 
So in the case of founder effect, it is actually an extreme case of genetic drift. So let's say in an originally small population, we've got 10 A's, 7 B's, 5 C's, 2 D's and 2 E's, and the letters are representing different characteristics and different genes. So the founder effect is a few originally rare alleles have founded a whole new colony, a whole new population. So it's an extreme case of genetic drift. So this is the genetic drift, which is the effect of uh, changes in alleles in a small population. And we're saying how they can have, they can experience a very big impact due to some little changes. The last factor that we'll talk about that affects evolution will be the selection of favorable alleles, which is a result because of mutation. And we can think about this in two types. So the sexual selection is about how um, the, num the alleles that promote mating success would increase in a population. So those alleles somehow code for a particular characteristic that means certain individuals are more likely to mate successfully. Therefore, the number of alleles for that characteristic would be passed on. Although the most co the more commonly uh, talked about one would be the natural selection, which is about how the alleles that promote survival success would be uh, would have an increasingly high frequency, uh, and that's again relatively straightforward because those alleles have given them a survival uh, advantage. Therefore, they're more likely to survive and reproduce, passing on the allele. And actually, with se natural selection, we can go into three specific types of natural selection. We say that uh, if we try to plot the number of individuals of different characteristics in a graph, then most of the time they would generate something called a normal distribution. So it looks a bit like this. So normal distribution is about how most of the individuals would sit in the average category, and only some would sit in the extreme categories there. So we say most of the time we have a uh, normal distri distribution curve for everything. Uh, and then only certain th situations would cause them to change. So in the case of stabilizing selection, we're talking about this in the situation where the average phenotype is selected. And what we mean by that is that there is a shift in terms of the distribution where there are less people with extreme phenotypes, but more people with the average one in the middle. So therefore the distribution curve will suddenly have a spike in the middle and less of the other ones. So an example would be um, that they use in the book is about uh, babies with different weights. So we say that babies that are underweight and babies who are overweight are less likely to survive and reproduce. So therefore there'll be more babies with the normal weight uh, would survive and reproduce passing on that gene for more babies with normal weight to be born. So therefore there's a shift in the middle bit there. So for directional selection, is talk about when one particular extreme phenotype would be selected. So uh, another example that they've used in the book is about the color of moths. So um, we say that moths can have two types. We've got the light colored moths and the dark colored moths. Now in the past, that most of the time that there are more light colored moths um, because, uh, because they provide, when they are on the surface of trees, uh, they can be camouflaged, whereas the darker moths on the light colored trees would be uh, would stand out and therefore they're more easily uh, eaten by birds, for example. However, because of the industrial revolution, so this is a selection pressure, uh, the suit is produced and covers onto the tree branches, uh, making the tree uh, trees of a darker color, therefore this time the dark moths have a better advantage in this case to survive and can be camouflaged, whereas the light ones don't. So therefore suddenly there's a massive shift in terms of the uh, population. So, and then therefore there is a uh, difference there. Now I've, exagger I've exaggerated the peak, but basically should be of the same peak, but hopefully this is obvious where there are more individuals of one particular extreme than the other one. And the last one will be the disruptive selection, where two extremes, both of the extremes, are selected in this case. Uh, now, it is really rare to see disruptive selection, um, but it has been seen in uh, some birds that are found in North uh, America. So the graph will look a bit like this, where the normal is no longer selected and the two extremes are. So uh, in the North America, an example in the book again, there are some male lazuli uh, buntings, which are a particular type of bird, and they look at the, the color of the feathers of the young male birds. And they looked at it in some of the duller color ones, um, they're not fretting, so they're left alone, meaning they are surviving better, whereas the, the birds with brighter feathers 
that are too frightening and therefore they don't have any competition and therefore the, they are generally left alone as well. Um, so basically, essentially, the dull ones are not being um, killed, so they have a chance of finding their own mate. The ones that are too bright don't get killed anyways because they scare off the other birds so they again can survive and reproduce. Whereas the ones in the middle who are not too dull and not too bright, they are somehow e more easily to be picked on, therefore they're less likely to survive to pass on their gene for that colour, so therefore there's less of them. So in a rare case, um, then disruptive selection would occur, although we have to say it's quite rare. And that is the selection of the Faber alleles. A quick recap for this one, we say that selection uh, is about how uh, the favorable alleles are selected because of different things. In the case of natural selection, we can have three types. We can have stabilizing selection, where the average is being selected, directional, where one extreme is selected, and disruptive is when both extremes are selected. So a very quick overview about all the factors that affect evolution. Number one uh, would be random mutation, leading to a genetic variation where favorable alleles can be selected. Uh, changes to a population size because of density dependent or independent factors uh, where they can lead to small changes which is gene flow due to migration or larger changes uh, uh, that can lead to genetic bottleneck things like uh, natural selection could do that and genetic bottleneck could uh, have a massive impact on future generations because of how certain alleles are completely wiped out uh, that are originally more abundant whereas gene flow are things that can be reversible in some sense because of the migration which can be uh, done backwards as well. Another one would be genetic drift, which is talk about uh, the changes in allele uh, alleles in a small population to begin with. And because they are a small population, they can experience a bigger impact on any changes to their allele frequencies. And in an extreme case would be uh, the founder effect where a few originally rare alleles can suddenly cause a, a whole new population to be formed. The last factor that would affect evolution would be the selection of alleles. The most notable one would be the natural selection, but actually we can have three types of natural selection. We can have stabilizing, directional and disruptive, uh, where different phenotypes will be selected at different scenarios. These are the factors that affect evolution or affecting the rate of evolution.